All right, and welcome everyone to another edition of Extreme Sports. We are so glad to be here this evening. NFL draft is over with y'all, and the playoffs are they're looming in the NBA. We're going to get into all of that. Um, first of all, let me just say that I hope everybody's doing well. Tough times we're going through, tough world we live in. Shout out to our good brother Dolph. Hope you're feeling better, my uh, my guy. You know you'll be back soon. Um, shout out to everybody who's here with us tonight. Sports Bay Ray, what's going on? Hi. And uh, my good uh, Morehouse brother Lawrence is in the building. Lawrence, what's going on? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Pleasure to be here. As always, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, just really hope everybody's doing well out there. Everybody continue to do the things you need to do to stay safe, be vigilant. Um, yeah, the vaccines are out there, but people are still out there doing whatever they want to do. So let's make sure we do our part and do what we got to do to take care of ourselves and take care of each other. And hopefully we come out of this thing soon. But let's move on to our first topic at hand. The 2021 NFL draft is over with, and it was a night full of excitement, especially the first two days. We got a prognosticus here on this show. I probably didn't just say that word right, but she deserves all her flowers. The last time we came to you all, Ray made a prediction that the Chicago Bears would make a move and trade up in the draft and get Justin Fields. And lo and behold, that is exactly what happened. They traded up to the number 11 spot in the draft with the New York Giants who moved down to select Justin Fields. Ray, the floor is yours because I'm going to just come to you every time I need a prediction for something. <laughs> um, first of all, it was, it was a very, very bold prediction that I had. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to happen. I didn't think they were smart enough. I did not think they were prepared enough to make that type of trade. So Thursday night came and it said Chicago trades their pick. Chicago is on the clock. I said, it's only one player y'all have to get at this moment. And if it's not Justin Fields, then it's wrong. And we got Justin Fields and I was so excited. Like, I'm really a good sports predictor. I should like, that was bold. That was really bold. Go ahead, Lawrence. Uh, I was gonna say, I love the fact that uh... Justin Fields now plays at Soldier Field Stadium. Like, he definitely can uh, own that, make it his. Uh, I loved it. I definitely loved the pick. Because um, if I'm right, if I've been listening to ESPN uh, uh, NFL uh, recently, they're saying that the Bears have never had, like, a 4,000-yard passer, like, in franchise history. So I definitely feel like Justin Fields has, like, all the makings to be the guy. You know, like, that man – and I, I love, him. not to mention he, he a black QB at that, but I love the fact that it's kind of like he's embracing it from what I've seen since he touched down in Chicago to even draft night. You know, we've there have been plenty of videos of uh, draftees who, you know, they go to a certain city and they sulking or they're not as enthusiastic. Well, from Justin, I saw immediately like the hunger to want to win and to be a, and to bring a winning team to the Chicago, to the Chicago Bears. So I'm excited for it. it. That was that was a great call. I must ask though, who did you have in the USC Kansas game? I mean, I had Kansas winning that game. I was wrong about that. I'll take my lumps on that one. But um, once again, shout out to Ray. Shout out to Justin Fields. I said on Twitter I might have to become a Bears fan now because Justin Fields is my guy. But as dirty as the media and many others tried to do him, I just want to see that brother coming in and tear it up. And I feel like he's in a perfect situation to do so. Chicago's got some nice pieces for him to throw the football to. We have to see how uh, Tariq Cohen comes back. But if he comes back what he once was, and hopefully he does come back in that shape, he's got a good running back right there to hand the ball off to. They've also uh, drafted well with another running back in this draft. Of course, we know about their defense. I believe that now gives them some juice to come out and play. Because uh, Ray, you all kind of in a position very similar to 
I can't remember the team off the tip of my tongue right now, but it will come to me. But teams that have great defenses, but they don't have the – all right, I'll give you a key example. Jacksonville when they were Saxonville. Coming back into that 2018 season, they still had all the pieces on that defense, and we saw early on how they were still coming out. It was week two of the 2018 season. They played the Patriots, and it looked like they were still going to be one of the favorites in the AFC season and play out that way. And we saw the defense come out, and they disappointed at times, but a lot of that had to do with the fact that, it, that they were throwing the Blake Bortles. So, Ray, before you even get into how you feel the defense is going to respond now that Justin Fields is going to be the answer at some point, if it was strictly just Andy Dalton and Nick Foles, just tell me what do you think your defense would have played like next season? All right, Lawrence, you go ahead and you chime in on this. Yeah, I would definitely say that Justin go to is, comp man. is competing for the job day one. I feel like if you didn't get Justin, of course, it's like like uh, when the Bears tweeted it out, like, Andy, you're QB1, we're going to roll with those punches. But now that you have Justin on your team, I feel like that opens the door. Not, I'm not, I'm not going to give him the job off rip. I wouldn't give anybody the job. You got to go earn it. But I definitely say with Justin Fields, there can be some optimism for, okay, maybe we come out of this year with a winning season. Ray, let's go ahead and get your thoughts because this is your team right here. This was your move. You predicted it. And I know you got to be excited for Khalil Mack and that defense. But – if you guys did not have Justin Fields and if it was just Andy Dalton and Nick Foles going in, what type of season do you think your defense would have given you this year? Um, it would have been the same of the same as last year. Defense um, was constantly saving us, constantly. Um, whether it be you know quick three and out so we can get the ball back, or you know whether it be like interceptions, you know turnovers, you know trying to um, build momentum for us um if it was just strictly andy dalton and nick Foles, and knowing how both of them are as quarterbacks it defense would have saved us a lot a lot we we wouldn't win any blowout games they would be close you know enough by like three points if we're lucky possibly win by a touchdown but now that justin fields is here i feel like we had the opportunity to kind of score higher than what we were scoring before um, he has great weapons around him, and I feel like like he's gonna complement our defense. Like I feel like he's gonna take a lot of work off of our defense. All right, now Lawrence, um, tell me your opinion again. What do you think this does for the Chicago Bears defense? Does this give them the juice that they've been missing to really go out and actually want to compete hard? Because they compete hard anyway. But I'll say it again. We saw this with the Jacksonville Jaguars defense, better known as Saxonville, coming into the 2018 season. They were coming off of a season where they made it to the AFC Championship game, and no one expected that. And they had a lockdown defense. But throughout the course of that 2018 season, we saw that defense grow tired of always having to bail out Blake Bortles. If they had a star quarterback, I believe that team would still be intact right now. With that being said, do you believe that the Chicago Bears defense has the juice that they need to keep this thing pushing going forward? I do. I do think they have the necessary playmakers at the right positions. Um, but to put all to put all your like you know your faith in all right, we're hyped now because Justin is here. I uh, I feel like for me it's a small bit of a reach because if Justin was if just Justin was that man he wouldn't have had the fall that he did. Now, I know that though, that is for external reasons, and I'm, I'm not putting that against us. And this, I, I'm a Justin Fields stand account, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's on, that, on that timetable to where it's like, oh, it's gold time for the defense. I don't think that Zach Wilson, if Zach Wilson wasn't one to be in Chicago, I don't think Zach Wilson is the type of quarterback to where it's like, all right, y'all, it's gold time now. Let's, let's get some stops, let's get some plays. I think that type of energy is going to come from 
the defense feeding off of itself more than anything. And, you know, outside of a, outside of a quarantine year, being able to get in the facility, have OTAs and training camp, be around the guys, that could be the missing ingredient as well. Because, yeah, they'll have to feed off of themselves. But as we saw with Jacksonville in 2018, those guys just grew tired. They grew tired of Blake Bortles as their quarterback. They grew tired of having to bail out an offense that had a lot of talent around it, too. Like, Keelan Cole, he's now a New York Jet. Uh, DJ Shark, they had some players in Jacksonville on that offense. They just didn't have the quarterback. And that's how I felt about Chicago going into this thing now. But now that Justin Fields is there, I feel good about the Bears going forward. And as far as my future Bears fandom, we'll see if that happens. Now, let's speak of another team here, the New York Jets. Zach Wilson, he's already getting more help than Sam Darnold did. They traded up in the first round to draft a very talented guard out of USC. He's a very good player. They added more wide receiver help. They added some running back help, and they still added help to the defense. I don't want to say that this is a no excuses type of thing for Zach Wilson, but I will say we're not going to give him the same passes that we gave Sam Darnold at times. Ray, go ahead and chime in. Um, I think the last episode that we said, uh, we actually had Zach Wilson going to the Jets. Um, I was surprised that they went and basically drafted like a whole new team. I was really shocked. Um, but you're right. He does have more help than Sam Donald uh, from the offensive line to the weapons to um, defense, along with um, they just hired a, a new coordinator. So I, I wouldn't say no excuses just yet. I would. It's one of those things you kind of have to like watch and see how it plays out. But he is he he is not the perfect match for New York, but he's basic, he's like a, a pasted version of Sam Darnold from how they play to how they look to how they act. It's literally the same person. He just has more weapons. He's more comfortable, if that makes sense. Like I'm, try, I'm trying to find the words to really describe it, but he's more comfortable and I feel like this will be a situation where he's going to be comfortable in New York. I don't think Sam was comfortable at all. I don't think Sam liked the way that New York was going. Um, Sam kind of had a, like a Aaron Rodgers situation like now. You know, he was very vocal about needing help and he didn't really have it. Zach Wilson has it. It's all a matter of, okay, what can we do with it? I definitely see the Jets winning roughly maybe four games. Just but we stop. just in time, because <laughs> uh, my good brother, Eli West, is in the building, resident New York Jets fan himself. Eli, what's up, bro? How you doing? Hey, man, what's going on? Perfect timing. Too. Yeah, you literally came in here for uh, perfect timing, so I'll just uh, rephrase the question to you. Zach Wilson, we pretty much expected him to be the number two overall pick in the draft. Of course, many of us here thought it should have been Justin Fields. I'm still going to stand on that. Now time to prove if I'm wrong. But... We saw the Jets do some things in this draft that we haven't seen them do in recent years. They traded back up in the first round to the number 14 overall pick and got a very talented offensive lineman, a guard, a big need for that team to go with an offensive lineman that they already had a good left tackle. They had a right tackle as he's building up his name as well. I believe they'll get that center position right as well. I believe they have a center there who I believe he can become something really good in this league. I'm not going to say great. I don't throw that word around a lot. But we also saw them add some more wide receiver help to already go along with Keelan Cole and Corey Davis. They added some good running back help in there as well, and they still continue to add pieces to the defense. With that being said, we can basically say that he's now getting more help than Sam Darnold ever got when he was in New York. So I don't want to say it's going to be a no excuses thing for him, but I will say that we won't give him the same passes that we would give Sam Darnold at times. Absolutely. Um, definitely something that me and Randolph said last time was that Sam Darnold wasn't given all the weapons to kind of succeed. Um, I wasn't a big fan of Sam Darnold to begin with coming into the Jets, but, you know, throughout his process, I had to give a little bit of slack because he dealt with a lot of wide receiver injuries. Offensive line was shady, but um, definitely the quarter that we got now, man, 
Look, I'm expecting seven, seven wins. You know, four, I mean, I'm a Jets fan. I ain't going to never say we're going to get four wins. But seven wins, I, I give a seven. You know, um, definitely our, our division is kind of wide open, um, as it's ever been since Brady's been gone. So the Bills right now are the top team. So I really think that we have a good chance of possibly um, running for the playoffs. Depends on how he transitions to the NFL. But um, we stay healthy, offensive line, man, we're looking really good, man. Looking really, really good. Of course, you know, center position, I'm a diehard Jet fan, so we'll never replace, you know, good old Hall of Fame Nick Manigo. But um, definitely, I believe that we're going to have a really good season this year to kind of get some of those cobwebs off that we've had for like five plus years. So, um, yeah. Go ahead, Lawrence, chime in on this before I get uh, before I give my two cents in on what he just said. Well, I would say that I'm glad you guys, the Jets, I'm glad you guys got the guy that you like. Um, I did see flashes from Sam Donald at USC that he can at least be a what's, – what's Minnesota, Minnesota quarterback? Um, okay. I forgot his name. But, yeah, like I, I saw that from Sam Donald, like as his like ceiling, like, given the right tools to be necessary. I saw that. So I hate for anybody to kind of be like giving a short stick and be like, Hey bro, I need you to make wine from water real quick, bro. Can you do it? Yes or no. But I feel like you all aren't as bad as the record proceeds. The previous one. It's kind of like, there were some games like, like uh, I guess the most infamous one is the Raiders uh, meltdown. It's just small things here and there. It's kind of like, okay, if this little part gets fixed, cool. And you don't, like, we don't know. That could be because Buddy went to sleep in that meeting and he don't know to play. So I don't think you all are that far off from being a, as you're saying, seven-win team. My question to you would be, would you call it a miracle if Zach is able to come get nine wins this year? Or do you think he's just ahead of the learning curve? Um. I would definitely say, like, if we're talking like a nine win season, possibly 10, I would consider that to be a miracle with what we got going on. Um, trust me, it's going to take, I believe it's going to take him some time to kind of develop into the system that we have over there in New York. Like any other uh, rookie quarterback, it usually takes him the first five, six games to really get into that rhythm. But if he really just comes out slinging and he's ready to go and he's mature enough to take on the position, I mean, I still think it'll be a miracle. But, you know, as I said, it can't be too much of a miracle with the division that we're in when we only got the Bills to really worry about. I mean, I get it. The Dolphins got a lot of weapons, great draft as well. But, I mean, pretty much everyone's matched up besides the Bills and their powerhouse that they're dealing with right now. So, we'll see. We'll definitely see. And I'm looking forward to seeing this division myself because the big question mark when it comes down to those Miami Dolphins is, is Tua Tonga Vailoa the franchise quarterback that they thought he was? Or are they going to be in the draft next year looking for that guy? And unless there is a surprise coming out of college football this season that we haven't seen yet, that's more than likely not going to happen because next year is not projected to be a great quarterback draft at all. So with that being said, I'd like to congratulate the New York Jets for finally hiring the right general manager. Joe Douglas, somebody who's in there doing something right. Because the more encouraging news besides the draft that he had was the news that came out the other day that they are looking to lock up safety Marcus May into a long-term contract. And one of the biggest problems that the Jets have had over the past few years, they draft players, they build them up, and then they just let them go. That's not going to build a winning culture. So this is a step in the right direction. And we'll just hold, see. hold on, hold on, X, hold on, X. One quick question. You said that the QB draft class isn't going to be good one next year, but I've seen some projections that say that the QB class could be, I would say, minus the generational talent that Trevor is, that the QB class could be straight. I mean, Spencer Rattler, he could have a huge hop. You got Sam Howell at North Carolina. You have I, I want to say JT Daniels at Georgia. There's there some people. There's some people now that could really, like, 
uh, send their name into and make it a good quarterback class. Look, I, I'm I'm gonna go off of one name that you mentioned. Um, I'm a big Spencer Rattler fan. Um, mainly, I get it because of QB one. I got to see him on that show, but uh. I mean, he's got a team that is known for quarterbacks to just throw for yards and touchdowns. So, I mean, given the circumstances, will he have a breakout season? Of course, because the offense is kind of set up for quarterbacks with big arms. But um, other than that, I mean, JT Daniel, I consider that a stretch. But I think that draft class is really like maybe two QBs max. I mean, unless someone breaks out that I haven't seen before. But two QBs, I mean, I think if Xavier's on the noggin with this one. Yeah, and let me just chime in and say uh, the Spencer Rattler, he's actually two years away from the draft. He started last season as a true freshman, so he won't be in that class next year, unfortunately. And uh, Lawrence, you mentioned JT Daniels. I'm a UGA fan. Don't ask me how I'm still a UGA fan after all these heartbreaks over the years. I just am. Not a fan of what I saw from him. Sorry, I'm just not. And maybe all of it isn't on him. Maybe it was a rebuilding program last season, and maybe he comes back, and it's not a COVID-filled season this year, and they don't have to take all the precautions they have to take, or they don't have to go through the questions of, are we going to have a season or aren't we? Because that played a role in this too. But from what I've seen so far, JT Daniels on the field, not a fan of him being a franchise quarterback in the NFL at all. No, to me, he's a slightly better version of Aaron Murray, and that was a glorified camp on Ray, you got anything that you uh, want to add to this before we move on to the uh, next topic? We are going to stick with the NFL draft. Um, I just want to say, Eli, I admire your faith in the Jets, but seven wins is such a stretch. Like, it's such a stretch. Honestly, look, if y'all get seven wins, I'll cash out you $20 if y'all get seven wins. Like, for real, for real, all jokes aside. Because Zach Wilson is a great quarterback. From the highlights that I have seen, this man – he got it. Like, he's talented. He knows that. He's confident. I love it. But y'all have to go against the Bills. Um, let's take it to consideration that New England is currently rebuilding. Um, and I like their rebuilding process. They look good off of who they got in the draft and who they got during free agency. Then you have Miami, um, who's just kind of in there. And then you have the Jets, who are just kind of like, dang, like, Oh, y'all still the football team? Like, that's what I think of when I think about the Jets. But seven wins? Seven? If y'all if y'all do it, I promise I will, I will catch up you $20. But I just feel like that's such a stretch. You're putting too much pressure on Zach. Like, <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit. I think the reason why I'm going with seven is not solely off of Zach Wilson. I mean, um, Zach in general, because, I mean, I wasn't the biggest of fan for him. I mean, I wanted Justin Fields like every other Jet Nation, you know. But given the circumstances of the draft that we've had and a lot of key um, components they put around him to kind of succeed, I mean, we've had terrible seasons under Darnold, but we've also had some pretty decent seasons when we were healthy. So I think with a healthy uh, wide receiver core offense that we're working with now, you know, working on defense as well, as Xavier mentioned as well, the long-term stay of Mays, you know, being a leadership position when we lost, you know, good old president, but, you know, someone stepping up into more of a defensive leadership role. I think that, honestly, seven wins is the best that I see the season going. You know, it can fluctuate between, you know, the four, five, six, seven, but seven is the best possible season I see us working with if everyone's on the same mindset this season. Now, don't be surprised if we possibly work our way into an eight and eight, but I'm going to stick with it. Hey, look, I'm going to remember about this money now, $20. Okay, look, you want cash at me that. And listen, another thing, I'm not saying I agree with you on the seven wins. All I'm going to say is this. There is a team at least every season in the NFL from both conferences who comes out of nowhere and is either a playoff team or a borderline playoff team the very next year after being horrible the season before. Maybe the Jets could be in that position. This is all going to depend on who Robert Sala is as a coach and Mike LaFleur, the brother of Matt LaFleur, the head coach of the Green Bay Packers. He's the offensive play caller for the New York Jets. Now let's stick with the NFL draft here just for a second. And before I continue, I just want everyone to know, yes, we are on Aaron Rodgers' watch on this show. 
we we are paying attention to all the updates. We understand that there is news coming out that a trade could possibly be done as soon as tonight. The Denver Broncos are said to be the front runner. I personally believe it should be the New York Giants. I will get into that in just a second. But we are on Aaron Rodgers' watch here on this show, and if that news breaks, we will bring it to you. But let's get back to the NFL draft for a second. Who do you guys think was the team that had the best overall draft? Eli, I'll start with you. Man, uh, best overall draft. I mean, honestly, honestly, you may not believe it on here, but I think truly the, the Bears did their thing, man. I'm going I'm to throw it out there. I mean, I didn't expect the Bears to kind of go out in the draft that they had, but if I was to give them a grade, and I was kind of going throughout this today when I was thinking about this potential question, I'm like, who had the best grade? I don't think anybody had an A-plus draft grade. I don't think this, this was one of those classes, but I think the Bears, honestly, they've got a smooth B, B-plus on me. Um, if Justin Fields is given the opportunity, I believe that they put a lot of positions around him to kind of grow into the role that they want him to be on this team, especially the underdog that he is. So honestly, I, I'll give it to the Bears for best draft class this year. Go ahead, Ray. Um, the team with the best overall draft, I would, I would have to say the Chicago Bears, um, not only because they're my team, but, um, from tackling our biggest issue, which was not having a quarterback to getting a quarterback, putting, um, an O-line in front of our quarterback and then going to get him, you know, just like some extra help. Um, it all like played out extremely well. Um, I think Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace were definitely, you know, they definitely succeeded in the mission that they had. Um, and it was a lot, it was a lot of trades going on with the Bears, but I think they, like, overall, like, we did what needed to be done. Like, we knew what we needed, we knew what we wanted, and we went and got it. And for that, like, for ESPN to say that we got an A-plus in the draft, that kind of, like, makes me happy. Because our drafts the past five years have been terrible. But this this year, they did what needed to be done. Lawrence, let's go ahead and move it over to you. I would say that my number one draft class would be the Patriots. As much as that, like, pains me, I feel like, pains me to say, I thought they addressed a lot of needs. Like they got Mac Jones, they got Christian Barmore, who I heard Christian Barmore had a, I think had a ceiling in the draft of going like top five at one point. So I feel like get him second round, that's a steal. Ronnie Perkins from the Oklahoma defensive line, that's a solid get. <clears throat> got the Oklahoma running back. I feel like I would have gave it to Dallas, but I feel like, it was almost like they were focusing on defense a little bit too much. Um, most, more specifically, like in the third round, I'd like to see Dallas go for the wide receiver, Taylor Wallace, that Baltimore ended up getting. I thought that would have been a nice get right there. Just, you know, yeah, we have a lot of offensive weapons, but it's always good for the backups to be just as dangerous as the starters. So I don't like to see, you know, them like, hey, Dak, we still, we, we see you. We see you working out. Here, here's a bone right here. Here's another toy. So I, if Dallas would have done that, I would've, it would have been Dallas. But I just feel like, you know, New England stuck to their game plan, hit on a couple of guys. I don't think they predict, they thought that Mac Jones would fall to them. But, hey, got their guy, supposedly. So I would give it to New England. I like all of the picks that you all said there. When it comes down to the Cowboys, my only uh, – because I liked their draft, but I didn't love it. And the main reason was they didn't really address a need that they had at safety. They signed Keanu Neal and DeMonte Casey, but they already announced, and this was before and after drafting Micah Parsons, they are still planning to move Keanu Neal to the inside linebacker position. And, of course, we understand why. Torn ACL, torn Achilles – his speed isn't exactly what it once was, but he can still be a playmaker for you on the field just at a different position. I really like what the Los Angeles Chargers did. I like what they did in their offseason as a whole, but I like the moves that they made in the draft. And 
it would not surprise me if the Chargers reemerge next season. If Justin Herbert is indeed everything that we think he is going into year two, we know what he had in year one. That was spectacular. But can he do it again in year two? And if he can, especially under this new head coach, it would not surprise me if they reemerge as a playoff team next season. So I'm going to give the edge to the Los Angeles Chargers. I give the Bears the second look. And I'm actually going to give the Cleveland Browns my third best draft grade. The Browns, and Eli, you'll remember this because Dolph didn't remember it when I was asking him about it last week. I believe you were on Extreme Sports at Savannah State when I went on the air, and I basically got clowned for this too. I said five years ago, the Cleveland Browns will be a contender in the NFL within five years. We're right at that fifth year, but they are officially in the contender conversation. Now, if they don't go out and get it done next year, that's on them because the pieces have been put into place. They addressed the needs they needed to have on defense. They arguably have the best running back tandem in the league right now. We'll see what happens with them at Odell. I don't know how long that's going to continue to be a thing, nor do I know how long it should continue to be a thing. Nothing against Odell, nothing against Baker. That dynamic just hasn't worked out. But maybe it can work out next season. We'll see. If not, of course, they're going to move on from him. But let's get into some Aaron Rodgers news here really quickly. No, the news has not broke yet. But this was the news that took over the NFL draft hours before it happened. And many people around the league probably didn't like that. It probably felt like you're taking all the spotlight away from these kids on their special night. But that was more so of a shot at the Green Bay Packers because of what they did to him last year, night one of the draft, trading up, getting Jordan Love, didn't talk to him, didn't consult with him about it. Not that you have to consult with players about the moves that you make, but when it's somebody the caliber of an Aaron Rodgers, it would be nice to at least get a phone call that you're planning to draft my potential replacement. And the Packers have done a lot of things wrong here. I'm not necessarily happy with the way that Aaron has gone about it, but I'm not surprised that we are at this point. We've heard these rumors for a few years now. And at first it was all with the Mike McCarthy era. What we've learned now is that this was all bigger than Mike McCarthy. And I don't believe he's going to suit up in Green Bay anymore. But Ray, you're a Bears fan. You just got Justin Fields, and now you potentially don't have to deal with Aaron Rodgers anymore. What were your initial thoughts when this news broke last Thursday, hours before the draft, that Aaron Rodgers no longer wants to play for the Green Bay Packers? Okay, so when the news broke, my reaction was, he's not going to leave. <laughs> that was my exact reaction. Then I started to put um, pieces of the puzzles together. Um, he doesn't, I don't want to say he doesn't have help, because Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones were a big help, but he doesn't have enough help. Um, defense, their defense is not the same. You guys remember just that phase, like Green Bay was just like that team that you just had to beat in the NFC, and it, it's not that anymore. Um, if he leaves, yeah, Chicago, we can take the NFC North, if he leaves. But then when you think about Aaron Rodgers leaving, it, it raises the question, okay, now where are you going to go? And it's a, don't get me wrong, it's a lot of teams that – could use a uh, Aaron Rodgers, but I feel like Green Bay because he's so valuable to them. This man is coming off of an MVP season. You don't you don't want to lose a player like that. I feel like Green Bay they're gonna do whatever they need to do to keep him. Um, the rumors are getting worse because you know he's talking to free agents and he's telling them, "Oh, I don't plan on coming back." But um, yeah, like it, it pegs the question of where are you gonna go? If you if you decide to up and leave Green Bay, who like who whose jersey are you gonna wear next season? And that's like the biggest question I think everybody kind of wants answered. Well, we're gonna get into our predictions for that in just a second. But you spoke about patching up that relationship. The news broke the other day. The number one thing he wants the organization to do is to fire the general manager, Brian Gutekis. I don't see that happening. And if it does, I'm not so sure it fixes all the issues because 
He was having issues in that organization before Brian Gutekis even showed up. Now, it should be noted that reports have came out that he is in group text messaging, referring to Brian Gutekis as Jerry Krause, the famous late general manager of the Chicago Bulls, responsible for constructing those championship teams with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and others, being coached by Phil Jackson. I wouldn't have gone that far because Jerry Krause is an accomplished general manager who was dry, shrewd, and proven. Brian Gutekis has not exactly proven anything on that level yet. But I get what Aaron Rodgers is getting at when he says that. I, I understand that. But I believe he has played his last game in Green Bay. I believe that a trade is imminent. I'm not going to say it's going to happen tonight. I'm not even going to say it's going to happen this week. But I do believe that before this month is over, he's going to have on somebody else's uniform. Um, Eli, we'll come to you next. What were your thoughts when you first heard that Aaron Rodgers wanted out of Green Bay? Um, not too surprised. I mean, he was kind of irritated on draft night when they got Jordan Love. So that's a big shot in the face. I mean, regardless, as you said before, it's not really the organization's job to reach out to your starting quarterback and say, like, hey, we'll get another quarterback. I mean, but at the same time, when you're an elite quarterback at the level that he's at, you would expect that he would at least know that someone's coming in, that he would be under him, that he would train, mentor, and coach until he's ready to depart. But um, that wasn't the case. So it started there, and then, you know, it just got worse. Now, I guess he's been dwelling on this the entire season, and then after the, um, the offseason happened, he had the opportunity to actually speak out on it. But at this point, I don't think – I mean, I'm with you on the fact that he will be gone, but I don't, I don't know if – if it's going to be, it's got to be a mega, a mega trade or something like something big has to happen. I mean, that much value. I mean, but at the same time, you're looking at age factor and how much is his life shelf, you know, for another team is another big question. I mean, he's not planning to play as long as Brady and, you know, it kind of looks like he's kind of going like three or four years, three years, maybe. And then, you know, maybe we're looking at a retirement, but as of right now, I believe that if any team would probably get him, I know we're going to predictions later, so I'm not going to go in there and give my prediction just yet. But when the news hit, I was like, I'm, I'm not surprised. That's pretty much the basis of what I'm saying. I'm not surprised about that at all. Yeah, Lawrence, before you chime in, I was more like you on this. I wasn't surprised at the news. The shock factor of it came from me that it happened on draft night. Um, taking that moment there away from the kids there for a little, that, that wasn't right. But it is what it is. Congratulations to all of the kids who were drafted. You know, you still had your moment. And nobody can take that away from you. But, yeah, it wasn't exactly the shock factor that he wants out of Green Bay. I mean, we talk about the Jordan Love thing. We saw how irritated he was with the Packers after the NFC Championship game. So that's why I believe this goes beyond Brian Gutekis. He wasn't exactly happy with the play calling of Matt LaFleur going into that game. You're close to getting into the end zone, and for four straight downs, you're just running the ball. You take the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands. This is Aaron Rodgers, a three-time reigning MVP. But he was an MVP last season. He was the reason that this NFC Championship game was finally in Green Bay. And it should be noted, I know the Bucks were up big in that game. Tom Brady had started playing horrible in the second half of that NFC championship game. So they definitely had a chance to come back and win, but they took the ball out of his hands. If they didn't take it out of his hands, who knows what would have happened. But it's something that's going beyond Brian Gutekiss at this point. Truthfully, listen, the Packers, they don't have an owner. They have to report to a group exactly with what they're going to do. The head of that group is Mark Murphy. I don't believe Aaron Rodgers and Mark Murphy necessarily have the best relationship. So Aaron, Aaron might want Mark, Mark Murphy gone too, but that's not going to happen. I also don't believe Brian Gutekiss is going to happen. And now there are reports coming out that they believe that Jordan Love is closer to ready to being ready to be their franchise quarterback, very similar to a Patrick Mahomes type of situation. Lawrence, I'll let you start to chime in now at this point because that's a huge prediction right there. Nobody expected Pat to come out. Patrick, I should say his mom doesn't like for anybody to call him Pat. I'm sorry about that. Patrick, I should say nobody expected him to come out and have the season that he had in 2018. 
But if he had been put in that fire as a rookie, I don't know if he would have came out and have been that anyway. But Lawrence, let's get into your reaction to Aaron Rodgers when that news broke from Adam Schefter last Thursday. He wanted out of Green Bay. Yeah, I feel like the writing's been on the wall for a while now. And I was actually surprised that it took him so long. Um, for me, trading up and getting Jordan Love, that would have been the final uh, nail in the coffin. I would have demanded a trade right then and there. But, you know, in a way, he went out and said, you know, but I'm going to show y'all how good I am anyways. Let y'all continue to refuse to give me quality help across the board. And he went to MVP. So, you know, like what, like what was said, there are plenty of teams that you put Aaron Rodgers on there and Super Bowl contention in either conference. So it'll be interesting to see where he goes because that can really change the landscape of the league. And with that being said, now let's get into our predictions here for a second. Eli, I'm going to start with you. Where do you believe Aaron Rodgers would be best suited if he is indeed traded within the next couple of weeks? Detroit Lions. That's, that's where I'm going. Um, he'll be a great fit in there, jumping in there. Um, Detroit Lions would definitely uh, take the opportunity of taking him. Um, I don't see a reason why they wouldn't. I understand they got to keep it there already that they're trying to get invested into. But um, if they want a shot at actually going to the playoffs and uh, winning – a possible um, a lot of games in the playoffs. Um, I believe that Detroit will be the number one option. Uh, smart wise, um, the the um, Packers can get a lot out of Detroit um, for Aaron Rodgers, and I think that Detroit will be willingly open to doing a lot of transactions with that trade. Um, so that's what I'm gonna say, Detroit. I can't go with Detroit because that is a division rival. And the Packers are not trading Aaron Rodgers to a division rival. They're not going to do that. They, they probably want to do everything they can to get him out of the conference. But I'll go ahead and I'll throw a prediction out at you guys, and I'll tell you why. And then, Ray, we'll get your thoughts on it. And, Lawrence, you already know where I'm going with this because you, you've been hearing me for a week now saying where I believe Aaron Rodgers should go. I believe Aaron Rodgers should be the next franchise quarterback of the New York Giants. The New York Giants have Saquon Barkley. They have a plethora of receiving weapons for him to throw the football to. And they have a defense that will more than likely be a top 10 defense if healthy next season. And it allows you to go into a division where there is no definitive winner right now. That's something that should be noted too. I know the Denver Broncos are said to be the favorite in this. And Denver actually has a package that they are finalizing to send to Green Bay now to see if it's good enough to land him. And Denver has some good players. The question I have when it comes to Denver is two. Do you want to compete in a division with Justin Herbert and Patrick Mahomes and to a lower degree, Derek Carr every single year? And is Vic Fangio going to be your head coach going forward? Do you want to walk into an uncertain situation? I believe there's a little bit more certainty around the New York Giants. And like I said, that division Washington, I don't know how much you actually trust Ryan Fitzpatrick as the quarterback. Dak is coming back, and I hope Dak comes back and he has a great season next year. But I have to see what the Dallas Cowboys defense is actually going to do next season and how they're going to put it all together. And then it's the Philadelphia Eagles. I love them getting Devontae Smith for Jalen Hurts. But I don't trust this head coach at all, Nick Sirianni. I don't know what he's going to bring to the table. But through everything he said in press conferences, it doesn't sound like that this was a great necessarily hire by the Philadelphia Eagles. And they probably could have done something better if they had have just gone ahead and let Doug Peterson went as soon as we knew that they were making a move to fire him. We pretty much knew this at the end of the season last year. But I'm going with the New York Giants as the team that should be the favorite to get Aaron Rodgers. Now, I understand what Dave Gettleman is saying as well, saying that what's going on with the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers is none of my business. Um, listen, and I'm going to say this one time, and Ray, then I want you to chime in. I know Dave Gettleman is one of these guys who comes across as if he knows everything about the game of football and nobody can tell him anything. 
if the Maras want Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Rodgers wants to come to the New York Giants, Dave Gettleman is going to do whatever the Maras tell him to do. And if he doesn't, he's going to be fired. It's that simple. Go ahead, Ray. Okay, so Eli said Aaron Rodgers to Detroit. Um, I don't want to face this man twice a year again. Um, I say no to Detroit because they just went and got Jared Goff. So um, I feel like that would just kind of complicate a lot of things that's going on um, in Detroit. Um, Eli, Denver, Mm, not not too sold on it, not too sold on it, just because they're in the same predicament as Detroit. You guys just went and traded for a quarterback. So it's, it's a whole bunch of question marks in the air. I think Aaron Rodgers will end up playing for the Falcons. And I say that because the Falcons have the best off- offensive weapons for him. They're currently trying to re- rebuild their defense. Um... You can't go wrong with Aaron Rodgers, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, Kyle Pitts, Hayden Hurst. All you have to do is go get you, you know, a running back. That's kind of decent. And you guys will get somewhere. On top of that, a whole new coaching staff. Um, And their coaching staff, from what I've seen um, in news articles and, you know, videos and interviews, they're very, like, open-minded to things that their players have to say. Um, players in the Falcons organizations have always been vocal and Arthur Blank takes pride in listening to his players and, you know, basically trying to, you know, build around them. If, if Aaron Rodgers goes anywhere, it would probably be the Atlanta Falcons. And I say that they need him. Arthur Blank, Julio Jones, Calvin, I think they're all past the Matt Ryan phase. I think Matt Ryan's time is up in Atlanta and Aaron Rodgers comes in. He gives them, you know, roughly, we'll say an 11 and six season because they're doing 17 games this upcoming season. They go 11 and six. We, we see playoffs. Boom. It all comes down to the NFC championship game. That that's my take on it, but knowing green Bay they're they'll probably try to do everything possible to get him in the AFC. Okay. Uh, here's what I'm going to say in regards to that. I don't think Aaron Rodgers wants to face Tom Brady and the Bucks and that defense twice a year. I mean, they already gave him a hard time already enough as it is. And um, number two, and all the Falcons fans in the world can get upset with what I'm about to say, but it's the truth. The Atlanta Falcons are known for making boneheaded decisions that don't make any sense. They should have taken a running back in the second round of this draft. Javante Williams was right there on the board. What did they do? They traded out of the pit. They, they didn't go get him. As much as I like Kyle Pitts, and I believe he's going to be a great player in this league, this was all about expanding the shelf life of Matt Ryan as long as they can. Because Justin Fields to Atlanta, that was something people were calling for. That's something their fans wanted to see. And it probably could have been a nice fit. And I, I'm not so sure how much he wants to let go of Matt Ryan who won an MVP in 2016. Let the Falcons to the Super Bowl. And, of course, we know about 28-3. to And things have been off in that organization ever since that situation spiraled downhill. So I don't believe the Falcons are in play here at all. Also, I don't believe Green Bay wants to take on Matt Ryan's contract. Because, or, well... Would they have to take on Matt Ryan's contract or not? I don't know if they would or not. But, Ray, you named all of those weapons that he would have. Would some of them or one of them have to be given up to make the trade happen? That's going to be the question in all of that. But I need, if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I need an organization like the Atlanta Falcons to show me that you are functional and that you don't make boneheaded decisions anymore with this new general manager and this new head coach before I even consider coming there. Lawrence, uh, let's go ahead and get your thoughts. Uh, I feel like the best place for A-Rod would be the Broncos. I feel like if they can put together a nice package like what was said, while also, you know, keeping a few pieces and stay competitive. 
Um, I I did hear that on his list he kind of wants to go west, so I could look at the Raiders as possibility too. Um, I just don't know that like there's a lot of variables I just I'm unsure about in terms of like how much longer can Aaron be an elite quarterback at that high level? You know, it's different like leaving your system. Like I understand Tom Brady did it, but that was also an offseason where Tampa Bay was making the rounds, picking up anybody and everybody they could to make that possibility. If you're getting traded into a team, they might not necessarily have that same means of bringing in whoever and, and uh, anybody that they can to ensure success. But I do like Denver if he's able to keep Jerry Judy, that young wide receiver core, you know, maybe a couple pieces. I wouldn't be too upset if they had to give up, say, like a Vaughn Miller because coming off of that Achilles, you don't know if he'll be the same. But I also wouldn't be against him going to, like we'll say, maybe a Detroit. I could see him coming to Atlanta. That would be interesting because I know I've heard that Julio, after that June 1st deadline, Julio is a person that might be traded himself. I don't know where y'all are getting this Atlanta thing from. I just don't see that happening at all. I don't see where they would even have the flexibility to make that happen. But go ahead, Ray. I already see you. Go ahead. Make your case. Okay. So we all we all know Atlanta needs a quarterback because they're past the Matt Ryan face. How do you get 3,500 yards every year and y'all have nothing to prove for it? Boom. Aaron Rodgers is not going to give you that problem. He's going to give you the yards. He's going to give you the touchdowns. He's going to give you the wins. It, it, look what he did in Green Bay with just Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones. He won MVP, Xavier. Like, he won MVP with only two people to help him. This man, if he comes down to Atlanta, you have two wide receivers, two tight ends, Someone of a running back, depending on who y'all go get, even if y'all resign Todd Gurley. And then you their O line is not extremely bad. Their O line is not extremely bad. I just didn't think they liked Matt Ryan. That's why he got sacked so much. But even more so, Matt um Aaron Rodgers is the type of quarterback, even when pressure is on his O line, he's not gonna stay in the pocket. We've seen this man run. He will get you the yards if need be. Green Bay. Matter of fact, Atlanta, Atlanta possibly would have to give up a lot to go get Aaron Rodgers, but I feel like that would not be a dummy move because y'all need a quarterback. Hey, if you guys pay attention, they're not sold on Matt Ryan completely entering this season. They're not 100% sold on Julio entering this season. Arthur Blank has made that very clear. Um, just last week, he said anybody can go. Anybody. So nobody has a guaranteed job in this Falcons organization. So if they get rid of Julio, they get rid of Julio. But Aaron Rodgers would still have a Calvin Ridley. He would still have a Kyle Pitts. He would still have a Hayden Hurst. He will – he can – I don't want to say he can do it by himself because he can't. But even with big plays and a lot of pressure, he can still go get the job done. He's not going to fall. I don't think we'll see Matt Ryan blow a 28-3 lead. Like, I don't think – in like – I don't think we'll see Aaron Rodgers do that. I'm sorry. I apologize. I messed up. But I don't think we'll see Aaron Rodgers do that. The Falcons this past season have managed to blow seven leads in seven different games. Aaron Rodgers is not letting that happen. Listen, I, I understand exactly what you're saying because, yes, the fit does make sense. I'm just not willing to give the Falcons organization any credit right now to do anything that would actually be smart. And that's no shade to the new general manager or the new coach. It's just what you walked into. This organization has shown that they have a history of making more boneheaded decisions. That's just what they've proven. Now, I hope that the new general manager comes in and he does different things. I hope this new head coach comes in and he's indeed proven. But until they prove something like that to me, I, I can't wish anything like that on Aaron Rodgers' career. Not, not, not that organization. I, I just can't do that to him. Now let's segue into some NBA here for a second. The playoffs are right around the corner. 
Eli, I see you pumping your fist, but you're probably not going to like what I'm about to say. The Brooklyn Nets have dropped two consecutive games to the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, they are now second in the Eastern Conference behind the Philadelphia Eagles. Not the Philadelphia Eagles, Philadelphia 76ers, excuse me. I like what you all can do talent-wise. Kevin Durant, as Lawrence knows, and I'm going to refer to him in his full name here, Kevin Wayne Durant, in my eyes, is the best basketball player in the world. You all can have LeBron James. I don't, I don't care about that. I know what happens when LeBron and KD get on the floor with each other. KD gets buckets. That's what happens, okay? Kyrie Irving, nobody's giving him the respect that he deserves. It, like at all, Kyrie Irving's name, if it wasn't for these missed games, he should be up in the MVP conversation for some of the things that he's done in Brooklyn this year on that court. And if they get James Harden back healthy, that's the big if right now because we don't know what's going on with the hamstring, and that's always a tricky injury. But if they get him back healthy, I still see them coming out of the East. And if they come out of the East, I just don't know who I would pick them to play in the Western Conference so far. Weeks ago, the Lakers were my favorites to come out of there. And right now, as, as you all know, the Lakers are my favorite team. I keep it real. It would be insulting to watch this Laker team go to the NBA Finals right now if the NBA allowed that to happen. They're not playing well at all. And I'm not so sure how close to 100% Anthony Davis is. LeBron James has no business even trying to play basketball right now. He needs to sit down somewhere and just let that ankle heal up. And Andre Drummond, do everything possible to keep the basketball out of his hands. Because what I have noticed is that when Andre Drummond plays well, the Lakers don't win games. Kyle Kuzma, as Lawrence said, peaked early. Kyle Kuzma, before LeBron James got there, he was having 30-point games. He looked like he had a chance to be a future star for this team. And now it, it has us questioning, do you even want to be great? But let's go back to the uh, Eastern Conference here for a second. We're going to touch on the West, but let's go back to the Eastern Conference for a second. I really like what we're seeing in the East. It's been a long time since we've seen this type of competition in the East. The Bucks are good. The Sixers are good. The Nets are good. The Knicks and the Hawks are interesting. You know what? I take that back. The Knicks are actually good. They're not just interesting. They're good. I like how the New York Knicks play basketball. And I knew Tom Thibodeau was going to come in there and change the culture around. I just didn't know it was going to look like this. Shout out to Julius Randle for not making excuses and for making the move that he made to go to a situation that nobody else wanted to go into. And he has just been balling this year. Tom Thibodeau has them playing well. Now, I'm not going to go nearly as far as some of these Knicks fans are going, saying that they're going to go to the conference finals or they got a chance to be an upset team that goes to the finals. No, you're still a ways away from that. But shout out to the Knicks and the great season that they've had so far this season. And we'll just see how it goes once they get to the playoffs. Atlanta is an interesting team. If the Celtics can get everybody healthy, they are an interesting team. The Charlotte Hornets with LaMelo Ball. That, that is an interesting team. And I believe that they are one of those future up and coming contenders in the Eastern Conference. Shout out to Michael Jordan, man. He finally got his start. He, it, took, it took a long time. He had to sit through the Adam Morrisons and the Bismack Biombos and the Michael Kidd Gilchrist of the world. But he finally got his star going forward. And he's got a good supporting cast around him. Devontae Graham, Miles Bridges, P.J. Washington. I like the move of them bringing Gordon Hayward over there. Gordon Hayward can focus on just being a star in his role in Charlotte and not have to focus on the pressure that was on him in Boston with the money that they were paying him and just how we know how Brad Stevens wanted to position him. That's a very interesting team as well. I'm a little disappointed in the Miami Heat. I was expecting them to get back into that top five in the Eastern Conference conversation once they acquired Victor Oladipo. He's been injured, unfortunately. But Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and that team, they just haven't been the same this year. Kendrick Nunn, some of that sparkle that was on him last season has fell off. Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson, they haven't been consistent enough at all this year. And it's just going to be interesting to me to see if Miami can even get into the playoffs because right now they are in that playoff 
tournament situation. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't think anybody wants to see the Washington Wizards with Mr. Triple Double and Bradley Bill right now. So, Eli, I'll let you go ahead and uh, start this thing off. I'm um, going to start it off where, um, <clears throat> where you started. Um, you came at my Brooklyn Nets with the uh, Bucks. The um, Mr. Regular Season is what I'm going to call him because that's all he is. Um, we've seen him when, it's, when it counts. But um, it, it's regular season. You know, it's regular season. I mean, we played them twice at home. I mean, I give them credit. I mean, first game lost by three. This game, you know, we lost um, fourth quarter at the end. I mean, I'm not going to say it's because we didn't have James Harden because we have more than enough to beat those guys. You know, more than enough star power. Um, as you mentioned, Kyrie Irving, I mean, dude, I mean, what the freak. Woke up this season and just, you know, really started transitioning to more of a, a shooter, I would say. I've seen a lot of tough shots, in the, you know, that he's taken this season, and he's just consistently knocking those tough shots down. Um, a lot of jumpers compared to just the average drive to the lane, get your M1s. He's taking a lot of shots this year. Kevin Durant, juggernaut, unstoppable, comes back from an injury, still 40-piece. You know, one of those things. Um, I give it to Giannis. I give it to him. You know, he, he's an amazing player. I've got to see him, like, consistently drop down that three ball. You know, as we always mention, if him, Ben Simmons, they can consistently get those three balls, man. You know, they're, they're different. Um, but, however, you know, I see the Bucs the same way I will, I, will, I will consistently look at the Bucs when it comes to postseason. Um, until it's shown otherwise that Giannis can actually step up when it counts, when it's elimination in the playoffs, um, it's going to be kind of hard for me to actually look at the Bucs seriously because it's just re repetition at this point. Um, we got Kevin Durant, who's been there before, Kyrie Irving, who's been in those situations before, and followed by if we get a healthy James Harden, who's been there before, we're looking at a caliber team that is surrounded by playoff-minded teams that are used to winning. Um, but I will say 76ers, they are – Joel Embiid is a very good basketball player, man. I mean, me and Xavier had a conversation earlier in this year about MVP race and stuff. Let me like, cut you off. Let me cut you off just ahead. for a second. Hold your thought. Because it's funny you bring that up. The 76ers defeated the Rockets tonight, 135 to 115, and Joel Embiid had 34 points and 12 rebounds. So despite the games he's missed, he's still in that MVP conversation. And that's been him and Doc and him and the arrival of Doc Rivers. Shout out to Doc Rivers because Doc Rivers has come in and he's changed the culture of Philadelphia. That's been the big difference maker there too. But him and the experience that he had coaching Kevin Garnett in Boston. And I'm not so sure if KG's been in Philly or if he's been texting or communicating back and forth with MB. But the impressive thing to me about MB this year, and then Eli, I want you to take this back. He's actually played like a big man this year. I don't, I don't see him sitting at the top of the key just trying to shoot threes. And it's a wonderful sight to see a big man actually play like a big man. There's still a place for that in basketball. And that is why I am rooting for him. And on the other hand, I'm rooting for either Jokic to win the MVP so we can end this conversation of there is no place for the big man in the NBA anymore. No, absolutely. Um, you know, Xavier mentioned earlier in the year that, you know, he had indeed – uh, he said he likes his MVPs uh, with winning records because I'm big on Steph Curry um, and everything he's done this year, very early in the season. And as I said before, he's single-handedly making a potential playoff run with the Warriors. But, you know, back to the East, you know, looking at LaMelo Ball and those Hornets, man, I mean, they coming off a 23-game win season last year. And, you know, right now they're looking like potential play-in, of course. And I think that LaMelo Ball has changed the culture on the Hornets, one of their young team, Miles Bridges is one of those players that gives the life. And when you bring fans back into that environment, man, oh my goodness. But I think LaMelo Ball has shown that he is more than just the hype when it came to the Ball Brothers. As we all mentioned before, I mean, he's been playing pro since he was 16, almost like a Luka situation where you've been playing for a very long time in the pro sphere. But his knack for the game, his passing, his vision just makes the team better. You know, when you got someone that's willing to just pass first, and then, you know, shoot is not even second. He's playing defense on rebounding in second. And then he's shooting third. So, you know, he's going to make the overall team a lot better, which is, as you said, making Gordon Hayward not have to take the front load as he had to for multiple years. He now can just be a shooter, be a spot-up shooter. You know, he doesn't have to worry about trying to play the point and the small forward at the same time. Um, but overall-wise, out of the East, 
if I'm to make a prediction about who's going to win out the East, of course, I'm a Brooklyn Nets fan, so I'm going to say Brooklyn Nets. But um, it's going to take a lot to knock down the 76ers. I'm going to say that. I'm definitely going to say that. But New York Knicks, man, huge, huge, huge win for them, man. Huge W this year for them. Julius Randle, I mean, gosh. I mean, I knew he had it in him. We all knew he had it in him. You know, maybe it was a situation that he was in before. But, I mean, he's kind of just missed the basketball this season. And I believe that the Knicks, you know, they're going to make the playoffs, of course. But I don't, I don't know if they're going to make it all the way through. Um, I just think that there's a lot of teams that he has to go through, not just, um, just a bunch of individuals. But overall, I say for the Eastern Conference Finals, man, I, I, I would like to see my Nets in there. But finals overall, East versus West, I'm going to say my Nets. And then on the West side, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's a toss up. I mean, we're going to touch on the West in just a second because I have completely just lost a favorite over there in that conference right now. But I like everything that you said there about the Nets. Listen, I still trust them to, of course, I trust Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving in those situations. And if James Harden comes back healthy, good night, Irene. That's all I got to say about that. I only question the team's defense, and I question some of Steve Nash's rotations. That, that's the big questionable thing right there for me. But I still like the Nets as my favorite to come out of the East right now. Milwaukee is slowly starting to grow on me, but I say slowly because I need you to get to the playoffs and actually get it done. And a report also came out today that Mike Budenholzer is on the hot seat. If the Bucks do not at least make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, he will more than likely be fired. Uh, Lawrence, let's go ahead and let's bring it over to you. Right now, what, is your, what are your thoughts on the uh, state of the Eastern Conference and who's your favorite to come out of there? Uh, right now, my favorite is still Philadelphia. Simply because I have not seen Brooklyn at full strength long enough. Um, I do like what the Knicks uh, are doing, like Eli said. Um, although I don't see them necessarily as an upset team that can make it to the finals, uh, I could see them coming in and pushing somebody in the seven. Uh, first round, put somebody in seven, possibly second round. Um, I like Atlanta. Uh, they got a, they just got a big win tonight, beating, uh, blowing out Phoenix. So I like at what Atlanta is showing flashes of. I just don't know if I can trust them. So kind of the same thing I have with uh, Brooklyn's team is I'm not worried about the Katie's, the Kyrie's, or James Harden. I'm more concerned about your role players and will your role players be able to make those crucial shots. But Joel Embiid is showing me what I thought he could have been for years now, which is the best big man in basketball. So if he can continue to play in his dominant level, I don't see anybody stopping Philadelphia. Go ahead, Ray. It's on you. Um, I like how we all can agree certain things about the Nets. Um, I do agree with Xavier. I feel like had Kyrie not missed so many games, he would definitely be in the MVP conversation. Um, I'm a LeBron fan, so I don't appreciate Xavier just coming so hard for him. Um, but you are right. He does need to rest because I feel like the best version of LeBron is always playoff LeBron. We never know what to expect. Um, I think a lot, I think y'all are sleeping on the Suns. And I say this because Chris Paul and Devin Booker really complement each other like really well. Um, do I see a deep playoff run ending in like the Western Conference Finals? No, not at all. I see second round at, at the most. I'll be surprised if, you know, they make it that far. Um, when it comes down to the Knicks, I'm a big Derrick Rose fan. I, I love him. Him and Julius Randle, they look so good together. They, you know, even though Rose is coming off the bench, but they, New York, the New, the New York, oh, Lord, tongue tied. The New York Knicks have potential. 
and I do think outside of the Suns, they are my sleeper team. I feel like you keep them healthy. They ha- they are like high off life. Like their momentum is very strong right now. Like extremely strong right now, and I'm here for it. Um, the 76ers, I'm not 100% sold on. I've never really been sold on them just because Joel, how he's playing now is how I needed him to play his first year, his second year. And then it continues to build up. And I just feel like, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's just like, okay, this is what I expected some years ago and I'm just now getting it. So it's just like, I don't know what, I don't know what to really do with that. Um, Miami, I don't really think they're going to make it just because the East right now is like the most competitive that it's ever been since LeBron left. Let me say that since LeBron left the East, this is the most competitive that it has been. Um, I don't really see Miami making it into playoffs. If they do, I don't see a deep run. I do not see a deep run. Um, I see the Bucks exiting first round. Um, Giannis is just like Eli said, he's Mr. Regular Season. He's that's that's what he is. Um, that's how he plays. Um, uh, when it comes down to playoffs, I don't think he he has that Kobe mentality to like win, if that makes sense. Like he he'll do enough to get you into playoffs and whoever they face in the playoffs, it will be a great series. But when it comes to, like, wanting to win and wanting to, you know, get to where you're trying to go, he just doesn't have it yet. I give it about, like, another year, and then, you know, maybe he'll have it. Sticking to the Bucks for a second, let me just go ahead and say this. And I don't know how many of you agree with what I'm about to say here, but the one team in particular that I believe the Bucks need to do everything possible to avoid in a first-round matchup would be a healthy Boston Celtics team. Jason Tatum is the truth. Jalen Brown is coming to his own this year. Kimba Walker is getting healthier. Marcus Smart is the instant pest on the team. Tristan Thompson is a playoff battle uh, tested veteran. We'll see what happens with Evan Fournier there. That situation has not gone well at all. And it's all because of COVID-19. So we'll see if he can get healthy enough to make his way into the team's rotation. But if the Celtics and get 100% healthy going into the playoffs. That is one team I think Milwaukee needs to avoid. And another reason I say it is because Brad Stevens and Mike Budenholzer in a coaching matchup, if it's an even playing field, I, I, I don't know how, how great of a chance I actually give Mike Budenholzer to necessarily get that done against Brad Stevens. And you all know Brad Stevens is not necessarily my favorite coach in the world right now. He's another one of those where I'm like, all right, I hear how great you are all the time, but now I need you to prove it. But that's one team I think they need to avoid. I've said it once, and I'll go ahead and I'll say it again. I'm just really disappointed with the season that Miami Heat have had. A lot of that has to do with COVID as well. Jimmy Butler missing some games due to health and protocols. But it it just has not been a great year for them. In particular, Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero have not taken the step as young players that they needed to take. And Kendrick Nunn, he's kind of taken a slight step back. I'm not going to blame this on Bam Adebayo because, if anything, he's been the piece that has been holding them together. Jimmy Butler hasn't had the season this year that he had last season either. He's shown flashes of it at times, but he hasn't consistently been that. So that's one team I don't think is going to make it in. Uh, The Indiana Pacers, I want to touch on them really quickly. Um, They're getting exactly what they deserve right now. Uh, Lawrence, I know you can appreciate what I'm about to say here. Uh, They fired Nate McMillan for no reason. No reason whatsoever. Nate McMillan got swept into the playoffs in the first round last year in that bubble, but... He was missing so many of his star players. Victor Oladipo really wasn't healthy enough to play. He was still recovering from that knee injury the season before. TJ Warren went down with an injury early in the series. They just fired the man for no reason. And they hired this new coach who they thought was going to come in and make things better. And 
he is more than likely going to be fired after his first season on the job. The Indiana Pacers organization is getting exactly what they deserve right now. They're on the outside looking in. I feel bad for the players that are there, but the organization and that front office know you're getting exactly what you deserve right now. I want to give a big shout out to the Washington Wizards because very early on in the season, we were clamoring, many of us, for them to trade Bradley Bill. That is how awful they were to start the season. And Russell Westbrook at the start of the season looked like a total shell of himself. Fast forward to where we are now. He has clinched his fourth, he, he's clinched his fourth overall season, I should say, of averaging a triple-double in his career. That is absolutely phenomenal. And they are on the cusp of making the playoff tournament in the Eastern Conference. And I also like uh, Rui, that young player that they have. Lawrence, you had a, a lot of good things to say about Rui coming out of the draft last year. What are your thoughts on him and just how the Wizards are performing right now? Um, honestly, I would say that they're, they're living in the moment. They're winning. Um, Russ and Brad have found the chemistry amongst each other. And they're playing some good ball. If I'm not mistaken, they're in the playoff tournament, the play-in tournament. And just the same way I look at Steph Curry and the Warriors in the play-in in the West, they can get hot for one game. They, they, Bradley or Steph, they can hit as many threes as need be for one game to move them on to the next uh, round. So I think uh, and Rui, he's just playing – I wouldn't necessarily say amazing, but – He's coming into his own. He's doing what needs to be done. I'm seeing him get a lot of minutes in crunch time. So we'll just have to see if he can keep building on his progressions. Yeah, I like the way that he's he, he's progressed, meaning Rui. He's progressed the way that I believe that they were hoping that Otto Porter was going to progress. And Otto Porter was moving in that direction, but then there towards the end it got a little stagnant. There was some dysfunction going on in the organization. That probably played a role in all of that there, too. But a shout-out to the Washington Wizards simply for not quitting. And now we will move on to the Western Conference, and we will start with the Golden State Warriors and uh, Steph Curry. I'm amazed at what I'm seeing Steph Curry do every single night. I'm not going to act like I'm not. My only concern with the Warriors in the play in the play-in tournament is who is his second guy that he can go to if he may not have it going. That's my only thing. When it comes down to the Wizards, there's Bradley Beal and there's Russell Westbrook. When there's Steph Curry, I don't know who the second guy is. Draymond Green has never been known as a scorer. I don't trust Andrew Wiggins. Kevon Looney, no. Right, right now, he doesn't have that second guy. But I hope he does get them into the actual playoffs because that would be something electrifying to see. Eli, we'll start off with you again because I know you've uh, been a huge Steph fan throughout the years and especially with what you're seeing this year. What do you think the Warriors are going to do once the play-in tournament does start? Yeah, so the play-in tournament starts, I still got Steph Curry, um, you know, doing what it needs to be done to kind of get his team into the playoffs. Once they get to the playoffs, I mean, do I see them possibly winning anything in the actual playoffs? No. But getting the chance to win a play on play in tournament to give them the playoff spot, the way Steph Curry has been playing this year, that man is on a mission. You know, he's kind of just proving all the doubters wrong when it comes to just, you know, the surrounding cast that he needed around him. You know, last year he had to deal with injuries, stuff like that. Terrible season that they had, missing clay, of course. This year is really like I'm seeing MVP Curry times two. You know, he's doing it all on, all on his own. I mean, I see when he's not playing well, they lose by 50. I mean, we've all seen it this year. You know, they've had, you know, huge blowout losses when he's not going. And it's, it's a sad moment because at the same time, I agree with you that when it comes to playing in tournament, if he has an off night, who's there? You know, who's going to pick up that off night? I mean, Aaron, Andrew Wiggins, he's had like maybe two games this year that was decent and pretty good spectacular games. But other than that, I mean – I don't trust Draymond Green taking over a slack besides throwing assists. I mean, that's all I can give him to do. But putting it in the point uh, category, I can't really trust him at all. So, honestly, that's why I say if they make it 
after the play-in tournament, they're an easy probably 4-0 sweep um, possibility type team. But um, definitely Steph Curry is still rooting for him. MVP this year. Hopefully, you know, they got different outcomes rather than, you know, what we're looking at now, but whatever. Ray, do you have any uh, thoughts you want to add to this? All right, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, stay in the Western Conference here because there have been some surprises this year. Uh, the Utah Jazz, uh, I don't exactly consider them a surprise because they were expected to be an elite team in the West last year. That did not happen because they were working Mike Conley into the system and they had to get used to playing with him. This year they're playing the way that, that – I'm not going to say I expect them to be the number one seed in the West last year because I did not, but I expect them to be a top three team. They're playing the way this season, the way Denver played last year that we expected Utah to play. And they have the coach that can do it too. The Phoenix Suns, however, Monty Williams, um, New Orleans Pelicans, um, I don't understand why you fired this man in 2015 after he led you to the playoffs after years of just being abysmal. Shout out to Chris Paul, who does not get the love that he deserves as one of the winning players in the league. When people categorize winning, they only want to uh, loop in championships. And it's like, do you understand that Chris Paul, everywhere he has gone, he has won. When he was in New Orleans, he won. With the Clippers, he turned that entire franchise around. With the Rockets, they went from being just a borderline contender in the Western Conference to being right neck and neck with the Golden State Warriors. He went to the Oklahoma City Thunder, and they were trying to tank. They were trying to be bad, and he was just too good, and they ended up in the playoffs last year and took the Houston Rockets to a game seven. And now in Phoenix, that team, we knew what they were coming out of the bubble, but I can't say that if he wasn't there this year, they would have been that. They're number two in the West right now. They only have 19 losses on the season. They took one of their biggest losses of the season tonight. No one really expected that to happen, but anybody can win on any given night in the NBA. We know that. But this is just phenomenal what I'm seeing by the Phoenix Suns. Shout out to Devin Booker. He's playing on both ends of the floor. I would like to see them use DeAndre Ayton a little bit more than they do because I believe he can be an abusing and bruising force down low. But shout out to Monty Williams, shout out to Chris Paul, shout out to general manager James Jones, who everybody said was not necessarily the best hire for them to make. As a matter of fact, I remember when people were coming out saying the Suns have been making horrible organizational decisions for a decade and now it's going to linger into the next decade. I'm just so proud in particular for all of these black men that are in these higher up positions right now that are defying the odds and are proving everyone wrong. Like this is big for the culture to open up doors for more to have the opportunity to come in and have those chances. We're seeing that in the NFL right now too. The Lions general manager, the Falcons general manager, we're, we're starting to see a change happen here in professional sports with more black people being put into executive roles. So a shout out to the Phoenix Suns. The Clippers have been exactly what I thought they would be this year. Uh, the Dallas Mavericks, I must say I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in the season that they've had. I understand Porzingis has been hurt, but Luca, if you're going to be that guy, you got to stop crying about every single foul that you don't get or the fouls that go against you. And you got to win a little bit more than this. And as far as the Lakers go, Lawrence, I told you from the beginning, after watching them for the first few games of the season, I did not like how this team was built. I stand on that. And now LeBron is hurt. We don't really know if AD is 100%, and they look awful. I understand they beat the Denver Nuggets the other night. Good on getting that win. But it is going to be tough down the stretch. We The Clippers tomorrow, the Blazers on Friday, you got the Pelicans down the stretch, the Pacers at Indiana, that's not going to be a walk in the park. I do hope they get that win. The only give me game coming up is the Houston Rockets. And that might not even be a give me game in it itself. 
it would be absolutely insulting if this team is currently constructed and playing the way they are playing are allowed to represent the NBA in the NBA Finals. And as of right now, I do not have a favorite to come out of the West just simply because there are some unexpected things that are happening. Portland has been up and down this year. No one really expected that. And Terry Stotts will probably not be back as the head coach of that team next season either. Shout out to Carmelo Anthony moving up to the uh, 10th all-time uh, scorer in the history of the NBA. Melo continuing to go out and prove that he still had something left in the tank, and he still does now. Uh, Dame, I, I honestly don't know how much longer Dame's going to be in Portland. I understand the loyalty factor there, but at some point, you you got to want to win, and you got to want to win big. And I don't know if that's going to happen in Portland, seriously. The Denver Nuggets, I'll go ahead and give Eli his flowers on this one. He predicted that Michael Porter Jr. was going to come into this league and be an impact player. And that is exactly what he has been for the Denver Nuggets this season. They're finally giving him his time to shine. Uh, I'm glad to see him healthy. That's the number one thing. I'm glad to see him healthy. Joker is one of the top three favorites for MVP right now. In the eyes of some people, he is the MVP. I don't like how they use Aaron Gordon, though. Because to me, they, they, they don't rotate him in and out of that system well enough. He doesn't really get to touch the ball enough. And when that trade was made, we thought, okay, this puts them right there with the Clippers and the Lakers. This was before we started to take the Phoenix Suns seriously, unfortunately. But they, don't, they haven't used him properly. And, of course, we know Jamal Murray, that horrible ACL injury. Prayers up to Jamal Murray. Shout out to you. Hope you come back better than ever but they could still be an interesting team come playoff time. But right now it's just hard for me to say that I actually have a favorite coming out of the West right now, because the team that I had coming out of there, they, they, they just look sloppy right now. Go ahead and take it Lawrence, because I know you got a lot to say about what I had to say about those Los Angeles Lakers. Indeed I do, but I'll keep it brief. Um, I'll say that the team is the team is built fine. We're we're legit. We're big across the board and healthy. Nobody's beating us four times in a row. No, four years in a row. Nobody in the West this year in the West. And so, it wouldn't be a shame that if we represent or like if I forgot how you phrased it. We come out the West, we earn that. Just like any other team would coming out of their conference. It's not our fault that people can't beat us. If you want to be, if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. So yeah, um, Braun came back way too early. In fact, they're talking about it earlier today on the jump that he wasn't scheduled to come back until next week. But for whatever reason, he uh, forced the issue and decided to uh, try to come back. But Frank Vogel did it, said it wasn't a setback. He just not he just won't play the next two games. I will say though that Anthony looks good. He looks fine. It's just a matter of you missed two months. Like you're not gonna look exactly where you were coming back. So I feel like with time and, and time and rep, more repetitions, we got eight games left for the regular season. He'll be fine. Uh, that Denver win was huge. We didn't have Braun. We didn't have Schroeder. Schroeder. We don't know when we get Schroeder back. Uh, Kuzma, as, as I said, peaked early. He going to give you them 10 points. That's it. Um, I like that Frank is playing Mark Gasol more. I think for a few weeks there, when we were when we were on that little three game losing streak, there was a lot of back and forth in the locker room. You had Mark Gasol getting no minutes, him coming out to the media saying, "I don't know why I'm not playing more." Kuzma came out and said, "Mark should be playing more." It was a whole lot of back and forth, back and forth going on there. But that Denver win showed me that they're back on track. They trust one another per se again and they're looking for the extra pass um i believe andre drummond i mean 
I can't put too much blame on him. He's coming in on the back half of a COVID season, learning a new system. Everywhere else he's been in his in his career has been terrible. It's, it, 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 the standard isn't even the same as coming into the L.A. Now you come in L.A., you don't only, only have the pressure of the city and what it means to be a champion, but you have to produce, like, ASAP because Braun and A.B. were down with that injury. So I feel like uh, drum is just going through some growing pains. Um, I forgot who it was against, but it was against one win. I saw him come out. I think he, he might have had 17, 18 rebounds. That's exactly what we need from him. And so I just find it tough for a Denver, uh, a Phoenix, a even even a um, uh, Utah to really compete with us in a seven game series. When healthy, when fully healthy. Now if we don't have brawl, we don't have shooter. God forbid, knock on wood, that Anthony go down again. Okay, you know, we're open for like we're we're vulnerable. But in the meantime, when healthy, ain't nobody stopping us. Ain't nobody stopping us. Like I've seen the absolute highs, which is all we can look at, like fantasize with absolute highs. A, a great game from Kuzma is 32. So if Kuzma giving you 32, Braun getting his buckets, and Anthony getting his buckets. How in the world can you possibly keep Andre Drummond off the boards? You can't in a perfect game. So I feel like with uh, if, which is the key word here, everything comes together, it's hard for anybody in the West this season with Jamal Murray's injury, Dame and them being up and down. The West really is wide open right now. It's hard for anybody else to have the depth, at least in the front court, to really derail the Lakers. My question when it comes to Utah is Donovan Mitchell and if and when he comes back healthy and because he's been out for a while now and what does that do to the chemistry of the Utah Jazz? Even with him healthy, I wasn't sure how much I was actually trusting him to potentially come out of the West anyway. But shout out to Spider. We hope you come back strong. Hope you come back great. When it comes down to the Lakers, I just think it's a very dangerous move to sit here and pin your hopes on a 36-year-old man who is in year 18. Uh, Watching this right now and how it's unfolding is reminding me of how the late, great Kobe Bryant, God rest his soul, year 17, what that was like watching. All those nagging injuries Kobe had in that final season his most underrated season, too, by a mile. Kobe was in the MVP conversation that season, but because Dwight Howard was injured, and even when he was out there, he wasn't playing to his full potential. Because Steve Nash was out hurt, Al Gasol was out hurt, and Meta World Peace was just a complete shell of himself. Kobe had to try and drag that Laker team to the playoffs. This isn't the situation with LeBron James, but they still depend on him to do so much. And when he comes back and he's 100% healthy, because I do believe that that will happen, what's the flow of the offense going to be like? Because when it comes down to LeBron-led team, everything runs through LeBron, and it can slow the ball down. And, like, that's something that may have worked five or six years ago. I'm not so sure how that system works now. When you look at Taylor Horton Tucker and when he feels like playing great Kyle Kuzma, they like to run. They like to get out and run a fast-paced offense. You can't do that with a 36-year-old LeBron James. And you can't do that with a hobbled-up Anthony Davis either. So, Eli, I want to get your thoughts in on this because I know you've been outspoken over the years when it comes down to LeBron James, the basketball player. Not LeBron James, the person per se, but the basketball player. Yeah, um, the Western Conference is a huge uh, question mark for me. Beginning of the season, I was like everybody else, you know, Lakers have no choice but to go out there and, you know, do it again. It's kind of what everyone expected, just come in very strong. 
I didn't like them when they got to the bubble because they played like how they're playing now. That's kind of like my biggest my comparison when they first got to the bubble. And then all of a sudden, you know, they really started clicking on all cylinders. Um, so once they're healthy, it'll be a better judgment for me because they're a very unhealthy team. They're um, inconsistent. Some nights they'll give you some glimmers and the other nights it's just like, all right, just regular basketball team. But I knew, I know the potential that they do have, but I got to be straightforward on the teams that are actually working day in and day out. Um, I think the Phoenix Suns is really my biggest team. One, Devin Booker deserves every bit of this um, that he's got. Also, as Xavier mentioned before, Chris Paul will probably never win, you know, an MVP for what he actually deserves. What uh, everything he does is just walking trailblazers, going from team to team, making every single organization better. Um, but I believe that with Xavier's point when it comes to the Suns, that missing link that they really need to start working is big man. We already know that, you know, the potential that he has down there with Aiton. And if Aiton can really get more and more into that darn rotation and they use him a lot more for his skill set that he does have inside, they, they're a real threat to a lot of teams. I mean, just their offensive scoring power, but if Aiton on defense, really, if he just starts getting more and more into who he, I believe he can be, if that happens, I mean, they're a hard team to beat. I mean, a lot of teams in the in the West in general are hurt, which is why it's kind of hard to the big question mark. You don't have any healthy teams legit-wise in the West Coast. But for me-wise, LeBron James is 36 years old, as Xavier mentioned. Of course, we're always going to have that conversation every year with LeBron James. Next year, we're going to be saying he's 37. You know, he's 38. And so, of course, you know, Bronny James get drafted, and maybe that'll be his last year. You know, but... At the same time, we do have to realize the small details that a lot of people aren't watching when it comes to LeBron. And Xavier pointed out quite well is that, you know, his slow pace is only getting slower on the offensive end. And this league is not really on the old school Spurs type of offense where you can run a very slow game and pace when you have a lot of athletes that are high energy and high motor on that Lakers team. So for me wise, as of right now, I would still say that my best team in there is the number one team of Ty, of course, but I would say the Phoenix Suns, my number one team, LeBron James healthy, Anthony Davis healthy, Schroeder and all them healthy. Of course, it'd be a great run for them and whoever's in the West. But I, as I agree with uh, Lawrence as well, nobody's sweeping the Lakers, even right now, the, con the condition they're in right now. I don't think anybody sweeps the Lakers in a four game series. I don't think anybody gets past a game five with the Lakers in the playoffs. But I do believe the team that will knock them out will be a seven game series. But I am in love with the Denver Nuggets. And what I've told everyone since I've been following him since Nathan Hale High School, Michael Porter Jr., I said was going to be the next biggest thing to happen in the NBA. I told everyone got the body size like Kevin Durant, but he can dribble the basketball, he can shoot the basketball on all three levels. But at the same time, he was a little bit on the slower side. And I knew that he needed more development. He, didn't, he got drafted 14. But I think Denver Nuggets had the biggest steal in that first round, drafted him at 14. He didn't play any college basketball games besides, like, the two that he had at the end of the season with that back injury. Got to the I was going to say, yeah, that's why he fell. That's why he yep. fell because they were scared of his back. Absolutely. And a lot of teams, you know, they passed up on that. And the thing is, the talent was always there. He had the open runs with the NBA players in the Drew League right before he went into college. He was scoring 30, 40, 50 points against Steph Curry and all of them in the Drew League. So I already, and I was like a high school kid, you know, getting ready for college. So that already told me the kid was going to be special. And then, of course, last year in the bubble as well, we've seen a few glimpses. And he was upset that he didn't get enough touches. And everyone on social media dragged him all over because he made a big complaint about how the team is not winning because he feels like he's not getting enough into the rotation. Jamal Murray, of course, I'm very sorry for his injury, of course, and all that in third, and prayers up to him and his family and him as well for a speedy recovery. But with Murray leaving, it opened up the door a lot more for Michael Porter to get more touches. And now everyone's starting to really see how special and talented this kid is. And the next person, of course, if somehow, some way, we can get Bobo on the same intensity, I think that team really is a hard team to beat when you got someone like Bobo, Michael Porter, Jokic, and then, of course, Aaron Gordon, we figure out what he wants to do on that team. But, um, yeah, I, I like the Suns, but I really like the Denver Nuggets. 
Yeah, if that I feel like Bull playing to the level that we want to see him play at, he showed some glimpses and some flashes of it last year in the bubble. If they can get him playing up to that point too, if the Nuggets end up not being a winner at that point and they're a healthy team, they're going to be looking for a new head coach. It's just that simple. I feel like that thing that Michael had said in the play in the bubble was the fact that the reason why we're losing these close games is because everybody knows the ball even going is either going to Jamal or Jokic. And I because I believe we did an episode about that. It was like he wasn't wrong, bro. That is exactly who y'all are going to every game. But it was like you don't tell it to the media first. They're like that's something you keep in house. But he wasn't wrong. And then it was like the very next game, he hit a dagger three. It was like, bro, if you feed me the ball, I'm gonna come through. <laughs> that was crazy. I'm I'm glad he was able to back that up because that would that could have been something that would have like burned him for like his career. Cause I mean, De- if, if D'Angelo went the ball down in, uh, with the Nets, he he was on the outskirts looking in. It, it was it was a wrap for him. Absolutely, man. I, I I was I was all on Michael Porter's side with that, and I agree with everybody else in the league that said like you know too outspoken. You're not wrong, but that's not that's locker room talk. That's not you know sitting in front of the media talk. And, you know, I kind of, you know, sometimes you want to look at his age and say, okay, he's young, first time in front of the cameras for real, you know, having a conference. But at the same time, you got to know basketball etiquette. You got to know just your, your teammates and how, you know, basketball is ran. Things happen in the locker room that aren't just supposed to be said out loud to the media. That's how rumors get started. That's how you trade. All of a sudden, you're on the trade block. You're leaving. And then, of course, as you said, if he didn't show up that next game, I mean, really, that's stamped. I mean, you're stamped for life. I mean, we already, as you talked about as well, you know, D'Angelo Russell, he was stamped after L.A. You know, he was stamped. And, you know, the thing is that saved his career. Brooklyn was a second chance. Not a lot of players get second chances in his league. Brooklyn was his second chance to just, you know, showcase himself again. Of course, I'm still mad at Brooklyn for letting him go. But, you know, his, his career is, this is going to be known as that guy that, you know, did what he did as a young player. But Michael Porter Jr., you know, he's going to be that one player that will really make a difference. I think the organization is starting to realize that now without, you know, Murray there, they're going to start realizing that next year has to be a transition where they're swinging the ball a lot more to him. So I will compare his rise right now to what was going on with Giannis in Milwaukee in the early going. Um, they wanted to build a team around Jabari Parker, and rightfully so. Jabari Parker was the number two overall pick in that draft. And if it wasn't for two torn ACLs, Jabari Parker would still be a problem in this league right now. And he's still a good role player for the Celtics as we speak. But once he went down with that second ACL tear, they started having to move the ball through Giannis and having to find that new start. And that's where we saw Giannis start to really live up to all that raw potential that some of those draft analysts were talking about on draft night in 2013. Ray, I know we said a lot there, and I know you didn't forget about what I said about your boy, Bron. Bron, so go ahead and give it to me. I know you got a lot to say. Um, Xavier, we can agree to disagree. We can agree to disagree. But um, I think all of you guys made really, really valid points, especially um, with LeBron and with the Suns. So I don't really have anything to say, but I love listening to y'all talk. Right, and one other team I want to throw out there, I'm not saying that, and I'm pretty sure we all feel this way because of what happened in the bubble last year after all the talking they did. I think we don't need to necessarily completely dismiss the Los Angeles Clippers right now. Rajon Rondo is a difference maker. It's a difference having Rondo in there as your point guard and facilitator as opposed to having to depend on Patrick Beverly. Um, I need Paul George and Kawhi Leonard to get in the playoffs and redeem themselves, in particular Paul George, uh, because I've seen Kawhi Leonard lead a team to an NBA championship not too long ago, just two years ago. So not so much on him, but yes, it's on him too, because he absolutely stunk it up in that game seven against Denver last year when the Nuggets completed that 3-1 comeback. But I need to see Paul George live up to his billing of playoff peak. Ever since he said that, there was no need in him giving himself that nickname, but we'll see what ends up happening there. 
Um, back to Dallas here for a second. Eli, where does Luca stand with you right now as far as his positioning in the league? Is he a top 10? Is he a top 15? Is he a top 20? Or is he a top 25? Um, I, I'm definitely – my position is going to be a little bit different than a lot of people's positions when it comes to Luca. Um, he's still very early in his career, very young in his career. You know, he had an extremely hot start, which is amazing. And I think the expectations now are so high on him when he doesn't have a good, like, a couple, three or four games stint like he normally has. You know, the league is very harsh on him. Um, I think right now he is not a top 25, top 10, or top five player in the league. I mean, at this current moment in this league today, yeah, I would probably say he's probably, like, top 15. I'll give him top 15 in this league but right now today. I'll give him top 15. And the reason why is because there's a lot of injuries. Um, Overall-wise, his, his play style, his ability to be a triple-double uh, player, his ability to, you know, shoot the deep ball, and, you know, he consistently shoot in game-winning situations. You know, he has confidence beyond his world for a young athlete. So given his confidence and his skill set that he does have, I, I give him a top 15 player, but he has a lot to work on that a lot of people don't look at. He can't dribble a basketball for real. You know, he has his few flashes there, here and there, but every athlete needs something that they need to work on. But overall wise, I think Luca, he relies so much on that jump shot that, you know, a lot of his rest of his game isn't as up to par with his shooting ability, but no one looks at that when you're winning and you're putting up good numbers. So I think Luca for right now is top 15 player in this current league. And he's on the outside of like that top 15, the, late, the latter half. I'm going to ask you another question, but I'm also going to add to what you just said about him as far as having things to work on. For some reason, defense is a lost part in this league. And uh, it's very sickening to me because that's one of the joys of watching the game of basketball when you truly love the game of basketball. You want to see teams going out there, being competitive, having battles that stay between 90 and 100 points not 130 and 140. Yes, that's exciting, high-octane offense. That's not exactly the best form of basketball. I mean, let's just be real about this for a second. And you can speak to this in particular because your younger brother, Jamar, shout out to Mark. Um, with some of these AAU coaches in particular today, and I'm not saying they all do this, but I've witnessed it myself. They don't teach the fundamentals of the game to players anymore. If anything, they tell them things like, go out and get handles like Kyrie and shoot like Steph Curry, and that is not how you play basketball. So defense is something Luka definitely has to work on as well, him and a great majority of this league. But my other question to you is, I'm going to put him up against another young player right now, not Michael Porter Jr. because we already discussed him. My other favorite young player in the league to watch right now, and I've loved watching him ever since he was a rookie, and Laker fans probably aren't going to like me for saying this, but you know what? It is what it is. I love watching Jason, T Jason Tatum play basketball. J Jason Tatum is absolutely – he's sensational to me. He, he needs to work on his defense as well. But he is absolutely sensational to me, and I'm not just saying that because he had a 60-point game last week. He came in as a rookie – when Gordon Hayward went down and when Kyrie went down in the playoffs and he, along with a young Jalen Brown, Terry Rozier, they took the Cleveland Cavaliers with LeBron James leading the way all the way to a game seven. Now, of course, LeBron was on a tear in 2018 and we pretty much knew how that was going to end up playing out. But would you rather build your team right now around Jason Tatum or Luka Doncic? Um, to me, that's a no-brainer. I'm building it around Jason Tatum. It's a mindset difference. You know, that's the biggest difference between those two. You know, Luca, he's, you know, he gets upset when he loses games and all that in the third. But I, I can tell passion for the overall game um, between the two. Um, Jason Tatum, he started his career off similar to Michael Porter. You know, when you had Kyrie out here taking up shots and stuff like that, where was Tatum? What was he doing? You know, 18 points, 19 points, you know. But what happened when Kyrie went down, all of a sudden people thought Jason Tatum was the next coming of Kobe. I'm like, it's been in him. He's always been that guy. You know, you can look well back to it, high school, even college days. 
he's always been this type of athlete. His mindset is always to be better than he was the day before. So I'm building a team easily around Jason Tatum. You know, you can build any team around a Luka Doncic type of player, of course. You know, he's, he's a great athlete. We all know that Jason Tatum as well needs to work on defense. And as you mentioned, very good point. AAU is not something where you learn how to play defense. That's where you learn how to score. That's how you learn how to make a difference between an offensive player and a defensive player. Do you want to be so good offensively that defense doesn't even matter to you? And, you know, I, I do blame a lot of that to the Steph Curry's of the league, being a role model, being able to shoot. James Harden of the league, just an offensive threat. I do blame a lot of that because that goes into schools all of a sudden wanting to put up high numbers. And if you can outscore the team you're playing against, you can win. Um, but as we're seeing now in this day and age in the NBA, we're starting to see 150, 160, 140 point games. And it really makes me think that we've gone too far and defense needs to come back. Um, but building team wise, it's kind of easy. You can put anybody around Jason Tatum. I feel, I feel like he will overall wise make a lot of players better. And he has that confidence that I would take a last shot with Jason Tatum over Luka, no matter how many game winners Luka has, which, you know, he has a few, quite a few under his belt. But if I'm going down a series and who am I picking, Jason Tatum or picking Luka, I'm going with Jason Tatum all day long because I know Jason Tatum is going to give 120% from when it starts to when it finishes. He doesn't get in his feelings. He's not emotional. And that's something we started seeing from Luka this year. You know, something that we really haven't seen much from him but he's like, I believe one technical away from like getting suspended or something like that. And, you know, that shows a lot about a basketball player. You know, sometimes, you know, we look at DeMarcus Cousins and, you know, he just can't control his mouth. But one is just Luka just whining over calls, you know, something I don't see Jason Tatum doing. So. My other thing I like about Jason Tatum as well is he takes pride in having a mid range game, which is something players don't exactly do a lot of anymore. Yes, Steph Curry revolutionized the game of basketball with a three-point shot, but you already alluded to it. I don't know if that was actually for the better of the game because just seeing players just shoot threes now all of a sudden, it's like, hey, well, that's not a guaranteed shot to go in, and neither is the mid-range shot. But when you see teams and when you see players go out here and do egregious things like shoot a three instead of going down in the lane and taking a wide-open layup, which is a guaranteed two points, that's a problem. But I agree with you, of course, with everything that you just said about Jason Tatum. And, of course, I would rather build around him as well. Ray, what are your thoughts on this? Would you rather see a team build around Jason Tatum or Luka? Um, in my personal opinion, um, because he is a Duke Blue Devil former, um, I'm building my team around Jason Tatum. He's young, and his whole mindset um, is – Kobe mentality. He wants to win. He wants to do what's best. He's going to take that last shot if he needs to. He's going to be a little bit selfish with the ball. Like you said, he does um, do the mid, mid shot. Um, Luca has so much potential, so much potential. But if I'm a general manager and I'm thinking long term, I'm thinking franchise, overall championships, I'm going with Jason. Just because Jason, he has that mm, like that killer leader instinct you know sometimes as a leader you have to be a tad bit selfish Luca one thing I noticed about him he he gets everyone involved which is a great thing which is a great thing but sometimes you know in order to win these games especially like the tough games the close games um you have to you know, unlock your Kobe mentality and you have to take that last shot. You have to be just a little bit selfish. Um, Luca is a great team player, um, which is something that I would look for in a player. But just overall, I'm going with Jason Tatum. Not because, you know, what he can do, but like the potential of things that he like he can do in the future. Like long term, year after year, I know he's going to constantly evolve. And every year since he has been in the league, he's unlocked a new level. I don't think a, a lot of people notice that, but every year he's unlocked a new level. Like It's like he discovers that he has a new talent every year, and he gets better and better. Luca has that potential, but Luca's like currently in a situation where, you know, you're just the overall, like you just get everybody involved. Jason is in that situation where, it's not guaranteed Kimba will be healthy. It's not guaranteed Jalen will be healthy. 
So sometimes, you know, you got to put the team on your shoulder and go to work. You know, you got to show up and show out. And he does exactly that. You know, Kobe, you know, he didn't make friends. He made champions. You know, big difference between, you know, Luca's mentality and Jason's mentality. You know, Jason Tatum, I won't be surprised if we hear a rumor or a press conference, Jason Tatum down the line, if the Celtics are not winning. If he has one of those moments where he's just chewing the locker room out, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised anytime down the future. But yeah, definitely. I feel like he does it now. Um, it's a lot of games that the Celtics have played over the course of his time there where they had potential to win a lot of games and they lose by like two points. They lose by five points. And I feel like he just goes in the locker room and he's just like, okay, y'all, like, what are y'all doing? Like, we could have won that game. Like, I feel like he, he has that leadership. Like, he, he has unlocked his Kobe. And we saw how Kobe's career played out, great career, Jason is like, he said, look, I want championships and I want them now. And we, we got to get there. He, he's doing whatever it, whatever it takes to get there. And, and the last point I'll make on this before we close things out, I believe Jason Tatum is exactly what people thought Brandon Ingram was going to be. And, and that's not shade at Brandon Ingram in any way whatsoever because he has blossomed and he has grown into a very good player. But his winning intangibles, that's questionable because if they were there, the New Orleans Pelicans would not be on the outside looking in of the play-in tournament right now. Not the playoffs, the, the play-in tournament. Like, this, this team has too much talent for them to have the season that they had this year. But – we expect them to get it together as well. But that's going to do it for this episode of Extreme Sports. I um, want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. Uh, shout out to Lawrence. He had to leave out, but as always, we appreciate what he brings to the table. And uh, once again, prayers up for my brother Dolph. Get well soon, bro. We know we're going to see you back in here soon. But we appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. Let us know your thoughts about some of the topics we talked about tonight. Let us know if you thought we were spot on, if we were a little off. We don't know exactly when we'll be coming back to you, but we will be coming back to you soon. Until then, everybody be easy, stay safe, stay healthy, be vigilant, be smart, and we'll see you when we see you.